messed up What can figure it out That's how it chooses you Fucking pros. We are professional. So um, you look beautiful today. Did Thank you. Did you spend that extra hour giving yourself a face mask and putting on some mascara? No, I've just been doing my hair this week. Yeah. And it's been really fun because I feel like a different person every day. I've been doing trying different things. This is my homage to Bridgerton. <laughs> yes. Sort of uh-huh. updo. Yeah. With. Complete with hair wrap. Yes, it has to be wrapped. It can't be free. It must be. Contained. Yeah, contained. Exactly. (laughs) Much like our emotions and sexual desires, it must be contained. Yes. We will talk about that (laughs) at a later time. Um, So thank you for recording an hour later today. Much appreciated. No problem. Um, I, I ran into the storyteller's lament this week, which is that I wanted to tell a story and I had a, what I thought was a pretty good sense of what it was and I was just going to put it together. And the more I worked on it, the more I realized that to tell this story, I have to tell three others. So (laughs) it's going to be a slightly longer project. And instead today, I'm going to share with you something that is, um, also close to my heart, uh, but is shorter and much more contained. So. It's not a giant sweeping historical arc that I'm trying to condense into an hour. It's literally a thing that happened and some interesting things about it. Yeah. Well, I look forward to it. (laughs) I guess we'll tell everyone this is the podcast It Chooses You. Hello, I'm Teresa Sparks. I am Claire Patton. Uh, We talk about things we like and things we are interested in. And Teresa often tells me, really wonderful stories <laughs> that you also get to hear <laughs> Yes, because you're the luckiest fuckers on the planet. That's right. The point is Claire and I talk to each other and you guys get to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely, there's definitely a weird amount of ego in there for me. Like we're so funny. Listen, don't you agree? Yeah. It's strange, <laughs> but it's fine. Listen to me. Listen to me. Well, you know, luckily it's a podcast. I'm not, I'm not piped into your house via radio. We're not Stalin. Okay, we're not making you yeah. listen to anything. It's not Jim Jones. That's There's right. not a radio in the corner of your room. You choose to listen, and we're really glad you have. Hello. <laughs> and luckily, <laughs> you are not reliant on us for any kind of actual news of the world and information. Because... It's a fact-free zone. Yeah, not because facts don't exist. Facts do exist, and the truth exists. But whether it's possible to discern it anymore is up for debate. But again, again, that's not the topic of today, so let's not let's not go into that. Oh my goodness. I feel like we should not stray. <laughs> yeah, let's stay focused. <laughs> All right. So, today I'm going to tell you about the holy shit, I'm not sure what year it happened. It's right here. Okay, hold on. So, can I guess? Yeah, sure. 1723. No. Uh 1875. No. Am I warmer? No. Oh, yes, you were warmer. <laughs> uh, 19? 19? Should I stay in 18? <laughs> I don't know. Wait, is it a guessing game or do you just want me to tell you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just okay. tell me. So, I, I'm as riveting as that would be for our listeners yeah. <laughs> to hear me guess for an guess hour. Guess years <laughs> for an hour and me just say yes or no. Yeah. Um, so this happened in 2012. It's very recent. Oh, wow, I was way off. Well, I mean, I set you up for it, right? Because you know I like stories about old ships of all kinds. Mm-hmm. I like lots of things having to do with old ships. And every, almost every story I've told you that involves an old ship happened before 1900. So you were you were fully That's correct true. on the based on the context I've given you so far <laughs> in our lives. You are so kind. <laughs> that was very kind. <laughs> Um, so the Costa Concordia is a cruise ship, and and it ran aground on January 13th, 2012, off the island of Giglio, which is off the coast of Italy. Okay, so my sources are the, the good old Encyclopedia Britannica, good old Wikipedia. There's a couple documentaries on YouTube. One of the, like, distress calls is on YouTube, and I listen to it in Italian in its entirety. Uh I say that in its entirety as though that's a fucking accomplishment. It was like three minutes long, but, uh, <laughs> but I need you guys to, it was fine. I need you guys to know I spent three minutes listening to Italian for you. 
And then there was a timeline that an environmental um, organization in Italy, whose acronym is CODACON, C-O-D-A-C-O-N-S, um, they did a timeline of the disaster. One of the things I'm gonna that's that's happening here, but that I'm not really gonna go into, is that this um, this running aground um, was a potential environmental disaster um, that ended up being averted. But um, so they oh, okay. have a very detailed timeline of of what happened that night. So. Uh, the story of the Costa Concordia is the story of a capsizing and sinking of an Italian cruise ship on Friday, January 13th, 2012. Friday the 13th? Hey. What the shit? Wait a minute. What? Something's oh my up. God. Okay. Sorry. Um, something something's is up with, up with that. that. Um, so, uh, it was a cruise ship and its whole gig was sailing the Mediterranean in seven day cruises. So start in Italy, go to France, go to Spain, circle back around. Beautiful, lovely cruise. And it was sort of a high-end ship. It was like the most luxurious, etc. Um, so after the ship ran aground, a six-hour rescue effort brought most of the passengers ashore. But 33 people died um, in this mm. um, disaster, including 27 passengers, five crew, and later a member of a salvage team that was trying to get the ship out of, out of the water. Um, and then several of the ship's crew, notably the captain, Francesco Scatino, were charged with various crimes afterward. Yeah. Mm. So the Costa Concordia was launched in 2005, um, and it was Italy's largest cruise ship. It was about 300 meters long, okay, um, which okay. is bigger than the Titanic, um, and it could carry about 3,700 people. Ooh, that's a lot of people. I mean, and it brings up, it brings to mind like the idea that cruise ships are essentially floating cities. They have everything that a city has, including waste, etc. But they're out there floating on the oceans. Yeah, and you want to maximize the capacity, right? Just that's like right. on an airplane, so that you can sell that's them right. ticks. I want tickets. Ticks is short for tickets. Thanks. People needed help with that one. You know, those of us in the know with the cruise. You guys world, aren't hip to the theater lingo. The Ticks is what we call those. <laughs> it was known for being a very luxurious ship, as I think I said. Um, it had four swimming pools, a full casino, and reportedly the largest spa ever constructed on a ship. And so it was basically like luxury honeymoon cruises of the Mediterranean. Okay, let's talk. Can we let's talk, talk about, about cruises, cruises for a second. <laughs> I've Me never either. been on a cruise. Nope. Have you ever been on a cruise? I have traveled two places on yes. a boat. I believe I even was overnight on a boat once, but it wasn't a cruise. It was, the point was to get from point A yes, to point that's B. that's a ferry. I, yeah, exactly. Ferry with a bed. Yes. <laughs> so I just, I know that sort of the cliche is that older people go on cruises. I do know a couple of people who are not older who go on cruises. I'm just wondering about like the mentality behind that. Cause it's like, you can, you know, it, ostensibly it's about the journey, right? But then you realize that the journey is just a lot of open water. <laughs> you kind of, once you've seen it, yeah. you've seen it. So there's something about going to various ports that seems very exotic. Mm -hmm. yep. But yeah, I've never been on a cruise. And my impression is that cruises are for people who would want to travel to a city, but would then not want to leave the hotel and would want the city brought to them at the hotel. That's my impression of, of cruises, is that you essentially get to live in the hotel all the time, and you go to one part of the hotel, and it's a swimming pool, and you go to another part, and it's a restaurant, and a spa, and several bars, and, you know, shows, and daycare, and whatever else, but it's all yeah. sort of within walking distance, and staffed. The seafood yes, bar. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the, the crab legs, and... All the shrimp cocktail you can That's eat, right. motherfuckers. So if you want to go to a new place, but you don't actually want to experience that place, and what you want to experience is a hotel in a new place, then I think you take a cruise. And that sounds very judgy because it is. I do not approve of them. I believe they are floating environmental disasters, uh, you know. And so I have lots of judgments. And that's all through here. So don't worry. If you feel judged now, you're only going to feel more judged as we go on. <laughs> yeah. And I got to say, you know, personally, not my thing. I don't think. I don't think I need to try it to know that. You know, let me just let me just advocate for that. You know, sometimes it's nice to just know you don't want to do something. Because there's a lot of things to do in this world. And it's okay to just say, I don't need to experience that to know that it's going to be hell for me. Sometimes it's good not to be open. 
just no, that's not for me. That's that's not for me. No, thank you. Just a very an appropriate no, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, climbing mountains. No, thank you. Taking a cruise. Yeah. No, yeah. thank you. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's a very nice point. Yeah, exactly. Well, also, I think cruises are, you know, maybe they're also for people who are terrified of flying or who don't, you know, like there are lots of other reasons you might go on a cruise. I'm trying like the sec in the second pass, I'm trying to be nice instead of judgy about cruises in general. And certainly I'm not judging any of the people on board for the way they reacted to this emergency. That is absolutely not what I'm doing. So on Friday, January 13th, 2012, the Concordia left Italy at about seven o'clock. Um, there were about a thousand crew and about 3,200 passengers on board. It was originating its journey. So it starts in Italy, does a seven-day loop, and comes back. Okay? So this Great. was the start okay. of its journey. It had just taken on about 600 new passengers. Um, as it approached Giglio, <laughs> Giglio Island um, a few hours later, it deviated from its standard course, moved closer to the island to do a maritime salute, which is like go closer than you should, which is you should stay about eight kilometers, I guess is normal. It went much, much closer than that, maybe like a thousand meters to like sound the horn and turn the lights on and do a salute of the island. Right. It was like the trucker <laughs> pulling Aww. down its horn yeah, just exa- for the, the kids. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like the kids on this island are going to love it. Right. Um. That was a common practice. It happens lots of times in cruise ships. You're like, ooh, party atmosphere. We're going to buzz the island, right? Um, But this night uh, at 930, uh, in the process of conducting this salute, the Concordia's port side connected with the reef, uh, and it tore a 170-foot-long gash in the ship's side. Yeah. That's at 930, and at 935, the electricity went out. Oh. Okay. So the moment before the ship struck the reef, most of the passengers were in one of the five restaurants on the ship. They're having dinner and drinks, enjoying the start of their holiday. Like I said, about 600 people had just boarded. Um, the rest of them were sort of midway on whatever portion of this cruise they were taking. Um, and so most of the people on board were in the restaurants uh, when it hit and then when the lights went out. So you have people in a public place. The, sh- the ship has hit something. You feel the jar. You hear the noise of metal scraping mm-hmm. on rock. And then the lights go out five minutes later. I bet people were screaming. And let's just take a moment to acknowledge that when the shit goes down, the last place you want to be is on a fucking cruise ship. (laughs) I mean, essentially, it's public transportation at that point. Like, you don't want to be on a train or a bus or like somewhere where your movement is curtailed out of that area. You want to be able to get out of there. That's right. And unfortunately, yeah, yeah. (laughs) that's a hundred percent true. Yes. Um, There's definitely a lot of um, personal autonomy that you relinquish when you get on a cruise ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, there's, there are a lot of videos of this, so you can watch the whole thing happen from piece together passenger videos online. Mm. Um, And I watched some of it and, you know, ultimately it's not, um, I'm sure it was very scary in the moment. Right. But at the point at which you look out and you see that you're essentially like the reason the ship is having trouble is because you ran aground. Like, you know, you're not going to die in the inky black depths of the Mediterranean. Right. Yeah. You can see the lights of shore. Like there's a little bit of um, comfort available Mm -hmm. to you um, in some places on the ship. You can see your situation. But like reports are that as soon as like right after the lights went south, the boat started shaking. Um there was like a noise, like in a movie, they say dishes were crashing to the floor. People were running. The boat started to list. And so furniture was sliding across the deck Mm. and all of these people are like, like falling downstairs and just cursing, cursing, cursing. And I wanted to talk to you for a second about um, Italians and how they curse because (laughs) as in my research, this is a substantial um, sub theme, right? (laughs) It's, yeah, it's yeah. like the, the Italian word cazzo. Is that how we say it? Cazzo. Cazzo. Yeah. yeah. Which seems to me, and you can confirm or deny, it's basically like our fuck. It's for everything. Yeah. It's yeah. like. It literally means dick. It means dick. Cazzo. But it is, they do use it as it, in the way that you would use the F word. Yeah. Right. So shock. So, suddenly I have a problem the saying F, The F word. I know. You were so demure. You just got so demure. Just well, like, it's the hairstyle. I yeah. can't help it. 
<laughs> I'm wearing a Regency hairstyle. I'm not allowed to admit that I have thoughts or feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of an all-purpose curse word, like our fuck. It's like disdain or shock or dismay or like all of those things. So mm -hmm. um, the videos that you watch are like, you know, middle-aged Italian men just saying dick, 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 dick right. constantly. <laughs> Yelling at each other, talking to themselves, talking to their wife, talking to their kids, you know, mm -hmm. it's it's pretty amazing. So <laughs> dick, 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 um, So a crew member at this point who is speaking over the intercom um, tells people in the, tells the passengers that, uh, the noise of the ship hitting the rocks was actually an electrical failure. Like that was the noise you heard is we're having trouble with our electricity. They obviously knew better at this point, right? I mean, they knew what happened. Well, that's an open question and we'll get okay. to that. So crew members are telling passengers that it's an, ele an electrical failure. And if afterward, a lot of crew were like, we told them whatever we thought would calm them down. <laughs> right. right which is another reason i will never go on a cruise <laughs> yeah because god bless but you have a city of three thirty seven hundred people and you have a thousand crew members and maybe 40 of those crew members actually know the state of the ship as an entity at any given mm -hmm. time and the rest of them are basically like serving your dinner or performing in the show or helping mm -hmm. you move your bags or like making the thing run, right? The, the staff is actually making the thing happen. They don't know everything that's going on on the boat, ship, mm -hmm. boat. Okay. So at 9.45 PM, which is then 10 minutes after the electricity goes out, the first alarm sounds. It's two long whistles and one short whistle, which tells the crew that there's a problem, right? So that's the other thing is the people who know what's happening on the ship at large are in a place where they cannot talk to the crew. So that yeah. of course the series of whistles is how they communicate. Yeah. And so finally we get some, some uh, indication that the people in charge have noticed <laughs> and are doing something about it and have an opinion right. about it. Right. Now the, that's that alarm signal just means something's wrong. Yeah. So I think that one uh, just means there is a problem. It just tells okay. the crew there is a problem. You, you know what else means there's a problem? Katsu. Katsu. Okay. <laughs> Everyone walking around. That should be the alarm. Katsu, katsu, katsu. If, you, if there's like more than 75% of the people on the ship at any given time are saying katsu, that means <laughs> yeah. there's a problem. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Um, so at around 9.50 p.m., the ship suddenly tilts dramatically to port. In the restaurants, dinnerware crashes off of tables. Some passengers start running to the cabin, their cabin for life vests. Some rush to the lifeboat deck. But like I said, 600 people were new to the ship that evening. They had not yet had a safety drill and they had no idea where to go or what to do. Oh, what a nightmare. Oh, what a nightmare. So a few minutes after the impact, the head of the engine room warned the captain that the hull had an irreparable tear that was about 70 meters long and water was entering and submerging the generators and the engines. So the bridge knows what's happening. A few minutes after, we know that the bridge knows what's happening. An assessment of the damage done by the engine crew, presumably, revealed that five compartments, including the engine room, were flooding, uh, and that's why the ship lost power. Uh, and neither the engines nor the rudder were functioning, and so the ship couldn't be steered. Yeah, I mean, you don't want water in the engine of anything. That's Yes, that's just bad. Yeah. <laughs> I'm no... Uh... I'm not a mechanical engineer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm no... don't even know the word for it. I'm not that thing. Uh, I'm fine being the, the goofy one. That's because your hair is so pretty today. See, with pretty hair, you're fine being goofy. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I, you know, I've put effort in today, and I'm just not going to put effort into remembering I'm done. what yeah. a mechanical engineer is, okay? <laughs> Ship can't be steered. Okay. So the wind and the stuck position of the rudder, right, means that the it's going in a direction. It's just it's not mm -hmm. controllable. So it's right. actually turning back toward the island, which is a great, okay. a great and happy coincidence. Right. So it's not actually stuck on the reef. It's... It's hit the reef, and now it's kind of a drift -ish. Yes. Yes. So I think if we want to look at, like, a tiny little snapshot, it hits the reef, which tears a gash in it. The gash causes the electrical failure. The electrical failure causes failure of steering. And then the mm -hmm. wind and the position of the rudder and the tides move the ship back, on, back toward land, where it does then run aground. Okay. Okay? So it wasn't stuck first, but it pretty soon gets stuck. Yeah. And 
the change in position actually when it was when it first hit it listed to port but then as it turned around and moved back toward the island after the electrics failed it started listing to starboard so it was listing to the left at first and then it listed to the right at about 20 degrees um, okay. and it ended up sinking uh, in water that went about halfway up the ship on like a shelf of rock on the edge of a, an abyss mm-hmm. uh, very on the shore, essentially, just offshore. Now, with the electrical fa- failure, did that affect their ability to call for help? It did not. Okay. So, well, that's, thank goodness for that. Yes. It also, there were emergency lights on the ship as well. As this is happening, as the, like, as the begin, everyone's realizing there's a problem, there's a whistle. Okay, it's the, the opening moments of, of everyone on the ship acknowledging there's an issue. At this point, a panicked passenger calls her daughter in Italy and says, hey, something's happening to our boat and we haven't heard from the captain. And, you know, could you maybe, could you maybe lend an assist or whatever? And the daughter calls the Italian Coast Guard and is like, hey. The Costa Concordia is in trouble. It's off the coast of this island. Could you maybe look into it? And so <laughs> the, the the call for help doesn't come from the Concordia. The the call for help comes from the harbor master who's like, hey, you guys, is everything okay out there? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the first contact is made at 1012, which is like 25 minutes after it hit the rocks. The port calls the Concordia. And an unidentified officer on the cruise ship insists that they are only suffering from an electrical blackout. It doesn't say anything about anything else. All right, look, if you're talking to the people that can help you, yeah. don't fucking lie. Yeah, well, that's a question, right? Because this wasn't a person on the bridge. This was somebody else, we think. So they may have just been regurgitating what they heard. Correct. From someone else. Yes, yeah. and and here we go, and here we see exactly why it's important in a situation where you have a few people overseeing the welfare of a lot of people, that lines of communication between all the members of the people making sure everything's okay be laid out in advance, and mm-hmm. you know signals have to be clear, and everyone needs to understand them, and apparently that's not what was happening on right. this ship at this point. Um, so did the bridge not communicate with the crew about what's happening? Okay. But why not? Like, what's what's going on? Okay. There's a passenger video at 1020 now that shows panic passengers in life jackets being told by a crew member that everything is under control and that they should return to their cabins. At 1026, the captain admits to the port, finally, this is what, 10 minutes later, 15 minutes later, he finally admits, okay, we're taking on some water. Could you please send out a tugboat? <laughs> Okay. Right. <laughs> to do what exactly? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, all kinds of questions here. So port authorities weren't alerted to the collision until 1042, which is about an hour after it happened. And they're at the port. Like everyone, this is a tiny island. Everyone in town is like, holy shit, there's a cruise ship that just wrecked right there. Mm-hmm. And then an hour <laughs> later, the captain's like, we have wrecked. <laughs> Could you please send help? And everyone's like, yeah, we know you wrecked. We can see it. The order to evacuate the ship wasn't given until 10.50. So it's like they hit the rocks. All this stuff happens. Everyone knows they're in trouble, but the captain's not talking to anyone. And then more than an hour after the ship has been listing to the side and taking on water, the captain's like, maybe we should leave. So he gives the orders to evacuate. Okay. So, but of course, in the meantime, passengers can feel and see that the ship is listing and they know that they're close to shore. So like in the absence of leadership, they're doing what people do, which is they start making their own fucking choices about how to help themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. Some passengers jump into the water and try and swim ashore. Others ready to evacuate, waiting for lifeboats to be available in life jackets. But crew members kept delaying them because the crew members weren't deploying the lifeboats because they had not yet been ordered to evacuate. Mm -hmm. So like the crew's trying to do what they're told, but they're not being told anything. And the passengers are like, what the fuck is happening? And the crew's like, we haven't been told to deploy the lifeboats. Okay. Half an hour before that abandoned ship order. So this is about 1020 or so. One crew member is recorded on video telling passengers at a muster station that, quote, we have solved the problems we had and we invite everyone to return to their cabins. So just all kinds of like it's happening over and over again. Some crew are like, everything's fine. Go back to your cabin. But it, it indicates like 
the goal of the crew, sure, we want everyone to get off safely. But in the meantime, we want to prevent a riot on this ship. And yeah, in the meantime, yeah. enjoy more delicious shrimp cocktail. Yes. They're just handing out bowls of shrimp cocktail to everyone in a life vest. Why aren't you eating? Are you nervous or something? Or is your appetite not? Oh, how about some liquor? You know, exactly. <laughs> just turn it into a party. Pass some more dirt. We are right? offering a, a filming of the, the movie Hope Floats in the uh, <laughs> movie deck. Why are you not watching that? Yeah. We have all kinds of options for you to maintain your uh, positive state of mind and not flip out. At the point at which the abandoned ship order is given, which is at 1050, the ship has listed so far to starboard that it's actually not possible to get the lifeboats down anymore. So if a ship is listing, the lifeboats on the near side, the one that's closest to the sea, um, will go down just fine. But the ones that are under the water on that near side obviously can't be deployed. And then the ones on the high side that are away from the sea, you start to lower them and they're just on ropes. And so they just lower into the hull of the ship and then knock and drag for a little bit. And then people are like, oh, I guess we can't lower them from here. Yeah. Yeah. So lifeboats, by the time they've they've ordered abandoned ship, lifeboats aren't really an option anymore. I mean, physics is pretty inconvenient. It is really. Like all of the plans for this should be around what people do when they're panicked and physics. Right. Mm-hmm. These are these are the guidelines <laughs> for how to do this. Okay. So second captain, uh, Roberto Bosio, um, is rumored afterward to have coordinated some of the deck officers in the evacuation. Uh, he started to evacuate the ship before Captain Scatino gave the order. And later, many junior officers and crew um, were, like, helping people get off the boat, readying lifeboats, doing all of that before the order had been given. And later, it was characterized as a mutiny. Mm, at the trial yeah. for this. Can you imagine a mutiny to save lives? Yeah. yeah. How dare you not do what I was telling you to do, which was nothing. Cazzo. <laughs> Cazzo. <laughs> um, so at this point, the harbor knows the ship is in trouble. The captain has known for a long time. The crew now knows. Uh, but the captain's still not communicating. At 1039, so 10 minutes before the captain says, hey, everybody, get off the ship, the first rescue vessel arrives because again, everyone on shore is like, holy shit, we got to go save those people. And this Island has about a thousand inhabitants. And it looks like many of them came out like in their own little boats. It was like Dunkirk, (laughs) right? Just like (laughs) sail out and get them. (laughs) I mean, this is, I feel like this story is such a good metaphor for what's happening in this country right now in some ways, (laughs) especially with the pandemic where it's like, all right, well, we got to do what we got to do and let's not wait for leadership to like actually coordinate anything effectively because we're fucked. Yeah. Well, and if they were actual leaders, there would have been communication about what the plan was. They would have identified the problem, made a plan and then communicated about it. That's kind of the definition of what a leader does. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't order the evacuation until like 10 minutes after people have started coming from shore to save people. Right. And then around 1120, Captain Scatino leaves the bridge and then abandons ship with like 400 people left on board. Oh, my God. He subsequently claimed that he fell off the Concordia (laughs) while assisting rescue operations and landed in a lifeboat. <laughs> I mean, sure, sure. Uh huh. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> so, Captain abandoned ship. About 15 minutes later, the last crew member leaves the bridge. There are still crew members and officers on board, but 15 minutes after Scatino bails, all the crew abandon the bridge. They're like, okay, we don't have, this is, this is not a, we're, it's not happening. Something else Situation is happening. Situation not under control. Correct. And like I said, 300 people were still on board. This is the, this is actually the best part of this story in my mind. And I, I debated when to tell it because you'll see why. But it's not the captain jumping, falling and it's not into a lifeboat. Unfortunately, there's no video of that. <laughs> Alas, for us all. Okay, at around 12.40, in a telephone call from the Coast Guard to Captain Scatino, 12.40, he's sitting in a lifeboat. 
He's not on shore yet. He's still with, he's still around the Concordia. But he's sitting in a lifeboat and he gets a call from the Coast Guard. And a Coast Guard captain, Gregorio de Falco, repeatedly orders Scatino to get back on board the ship and take charge of rescue operations. And this call, Claire, is the funniest. Like, this guy, DeFalco, is a fucking badass. So he's on, he's on the phone, and it's loud. It's loud where they both are. This is an emergency. Yeah. So they're shouting anyway. But he's like, what do you mean you fell into a lifeboat? <laughs> okay, but there's a ladder right now. There's a ladder, yeah? There's a ladder right there. You see, you see the people? I can see them from where I am, so I know you can see them. You see the people <laughs> climbing down that ladder? So what you're going to do is you're going to go to the ladder and climb back up it. And you're going to get back on your fucking ship and you are going to and he's he's like no and the and the captain is like not present. The captain sounds like I sound when I'm high, which is like I'm only tangentially involved in the narrative that is taking place around me. And I'm super in my own world and I'm not really able to follow what's happening or be involved in it in any sort of meaningful way. It's just like things are happening around me. That's how he yeah. sounds in this phone call. He's completely disassociated yeah. from the situation. He's speaking yeah. quietly. He's not really answering the questions. This DeFalco is like being very, very, what I would consider like, it, I mean, it was shocking to me. I imagine Italians yell at each other all the time anyway, but that's just my thing about Italians, <laughs> which I don't really, I don't know where it comes from. I don't, I only know two Italians and they're both delightful people. So I don't know what right. my problem is, but I just imagine there's often yelling. Or like dramatically raised voices in an Italian I, workplace. I, I, I would I would say that's accurate. <laughs> um, and so this guy is like, "No, here's what you're gonna do, motherfucker." And the captain's like, "No, no, I haven't left. I'm still here. I'm still supervising." He's like, "How can you supervise from a lifeboat? Get on the bridge!" Like, and and ultimately he's like, "Get on." He he's like, "Cazzo, get on the fucking boat! Like, <laughs> you have to go." And he doesn't. Scatino never gets back on the ship. Wow. Yeah. Oh, my God. You can hear that uh, exchange on YouTube, and I highly recommend it. If you like, it's amazing, this guy, because he like tries he tries to go slowly and be gentle. And then as gentleness doesn't work, he's like, you fucking listen to me. This is what yeah, you're going to yeah. do. And Scatino calls him captain because he, too, is a captain. And he's just like a little boy. He's like, I don't really understand what's happening. Like, it's it's yeah. very disturbing. daddy's mad. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. So Scatino refuses to return to the ship. Um, by this time, though, the rescue operations included 25 patrol boats, 14 merchant vessels, numerous helicopters, and by the early morning hours, over 4,000 people had been evacuated from the Concordia and taken to the island. Um, so the majority of people were rescued relatively quickly. Although, if you're on shore and the rescue takes seven hours, like, there are lots of questions. There are questions, yes. you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. At one point, the deputy mayor of the capital of that island went on board to help with the rescue operations and oh and God. he was and when he talked about it after he said he praised the ship's doctor and he he praised a young officer whose name i want to say she was simone canessa who was the only officer he met on board in like four yeah. hours of rescue operations and he said that like she and he worked shoulder by shoulder getting people off the boat for like five hours you just throwing this out there, you know what a good quality and a leader is, is someone who's good in a fucking crisis. Yeah, exactly. Who like engages <laughs> yeah. when shit goes down. I feel, I feel like they should do like a dry run, uh -huh. you know, a really realistic yeah. scenario like you have to do with flight simulation and things like that. <laughs> yeah. If you're in any position of power, you should have to have like a crisis simulation Yes. to see if. Uh, you can handle your shit. Uh huh. I mean, where is the Kobayashi Maru of of cruise ship captain training? Where is the unwinnable scenario that you have to face to figure out whether or not you have any gumption? You know, like yeah. where it yeah. apparently it doesn't exist. At six seventeen a.m., the majority of people have been brought to shore. Rescue efforts are temporarily suspended, um, but then the fall in the following days they. Uh, pull in a few more survivors from inside the Concordia. Um, yeah. So <laughs> almost immediately, 
questions were raised concerning the conduct of Scatino and the other officers. Oh, yeah. I mean, and by almost immediately, I mean as it was unfolding. Everyone's like, who the mm-hmm. fuck is this guy? Okay, so now we have a little more information about what Scatino was up to before the ship hit the rocks. He had initially said that the ship was about 300 meters from the shore, which is about as long as the vessel, and hit a, quote, uncharted rock. The ship's first officer told investigators that Scatino had left his reading glasses in his cabin and that he repeatedly asked the first officer to check the radar for him. So he's in the, he's the captain and he can't see the readouts from his <laughs> ship, <laughs> from his machines. Uh, additionally, at the captain's invitation, the Mater D of the ship, who was from that island, was on the bridge to view it during the sail by, which I guess is a nice thing that he did. But also on the bridge at this time was a Moldovan dancer who testified that she was, at the time, in a romantic relationship with Scatino and had just boarded the ship as a non-paying passenger. Yeah. Okay, so I, now I know what's happening. A picture is beginning to... Yes. Yeah, yeah. This guy was showing off for these people with this with this flyby, whatever, or, you know, ship-by. That's right. Ship by, That's right. As he said, perfect. Absolutely perfect. He said that before approaching the island, he turned off the alarm system for the computer's navigation system because, quote, I was navigating by sight because I know those seabeds so well. Oh, yeah. He was showing off. Yeah. This was 100% ego. Yes. And he was 100% responsible. Yes. He told investigators that he saw waves breaking on the reef and ordered an abrupt turn, swinging the side of the hull into the reef as they moved to go away. He said, this time... I ordered the turn too late. Okay. In the midst of this deadly evacuation, a ship's cook later testified that Scatino ordered dinner from the kitchen at around 1030, which is 45 minutes after the power went out. Uh, Hey, kitchen. Uh, I got a hankering for some Bucatini Amatriciana. Could you, uh, you know what? Uh, crisis makes me hungry. Could you uh, bring me a hot, nasty plate of pasta, please? Thank you. And then the cook, and then the cook gets back on, and all you can hear is the cook shouting with screams and fires and explosions in the background, like the kitchen's closed. <laughs> Sorry, Cap, the kitchen's mm-hmm. closed. Oh my god. <laughs> okay. Um. So some sources say that the ship didn't actually start to list as far as it finally did until much later, like 1015. And if he had given the order to evacuate in a timely way, they would have been able to use all the lifeboats, potentially saving yeah. the 33 lives that were I lost. Have no doubt. Have no, I doubt. Have no doubt. Yeah. Can you imagine? Can you fucking imagine? Showing off for a maitre d' and a dancer, trying to be cool, and then... And then having 33 people's deaths on your conscience. Yeah, trying to, like, didn't bring his reading glasses to his job. Like, needs to read for his job. Didn't bring his reading glasses for his job. Because I get, I mean, you can see photos. He's a slightly more than middle-aged man. And he has this young dancer who's his whatever. I can't have my reading glasses on. Yeah. The, uh, yes, ego, ego kills, people. Ego kills. In July 2013. Okay, so this is like six months after all of this goes down. Four crew members and the crisis coordinator of the Costa Concordia plead guilty to various charges, including manslaughter. Uh, The crew and that crisis coordinator, their sentences were less than three years. Okay, they were sentenced to prison for this, Mm -hmm. but their sentences were less than three years. That same month, Scatino went on trial after... Being denied a plea bargain. Which means he wanted a plea bargain of some kind for all this shit. And they're like, nah, you clearly did this. You've got to be kidding. He was denied a plea plea bargain. He was charged with manslaughter as well as causing the wreck and abandoning ship, which apparently is a law that captains must follow. Don't abandon ship. It turns out that's real. That's a law. During the 19-month trial, prosecutors claimed that he was, quote, an idiot, (laughs) while Scatino countered that his actions had actually saved lives and that he was being scapegoated. 
I think idiot is an actual legal designation in Italy. <laughs> idiot. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean there are consequences for my choices? So, I mean, really, it's just like, I thought immediately of Brett Kavanaugh, like, crying yeah. <laughs> about the fact that he had sexually assaulted someone when he was drunk. And now this guy's like, I'm being scapegoated for being held responsible for the deaths I caused. In February of 2015, Scatino was, unsurprisingly, convicted on all charges and sentenced to 16, <laughs> 16 years in prison. I mean, clearly, Good. nothing but evidence, right? Nothing but evidence. Um, he appealed. What the fuck? He appealed. <laughs> yeah, but and they were like, nah, bro. <laughs> and they were like, no, really, we have 400 hours of video showing that you did absolutely nothing but cause problems here. Yeah. Uh, his, his conviction was upheld in May of 2017, and he began serving his 16-year sentence shortly thereafter. So that is the story of the idiot captain of the Costa Concordia God. and his male middle-aged ego issues that led to the right. deaths of 33 people. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, at least there's cold comfort in the fact that he was convicted and is serving his sentence. I mean, yes. Well, and listening to the Harbor master, when I heard that call, I was like, there's no way he's going to get out of this. And it made me so happy. Because everyone else who saw what was happening had such a clear picture of A, what was happening, B, what needed to be done, and C, the gaps between those two things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> here's what mm -hmm. needs to happen. Here's what is happening. Holy shit. And everyone saw it immediately on the night. And he was like, eh. And yeah. And so he was right, rightly convicted. Yeah. <laughs> you know what this reminds me of? Did you ever see that show on HBO called Avenue A? I know I recommended it to you. You did, and I don't think I ever watched it. So it's it reminds me of this a lot in the sense that it is about a space cruise ship mm. that encounters some severe difficulties, and which will likely result in the deaths of everyone on board. Mm. And Hugh Laurie plays the captain of this cruise ship and slight spoiler here for anyone. Uh, it turns out Hugh Laurie is an actor. The ship is fully automated. Uh, yeah. <laughs> He's just been hired because he looks captainly. Yeah. But it is, it's a really quirky, fun show. What it does so expertly is show these types of disaster moments mm -hmm. where the artificial gravity goes and people are flung up and down and it, you know, comes back on for a second and it, and this sense of the crowd losing their shit and everyone panicking. And then also the selfishness and self-preservation that comes out. It's unparalleled in its depiction of this kind of thing. So if, if anyone out there really digs this kind of story, <laughs> I highly recommend awesome. watching. I think it's, it's one season so far of Avenue A on HBO. It's, it's really silly and fun. Cool. Thank you for that. Teresa, thank you so much for telling me that harrowing <laughs> And satisfying story. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're welcome. Um, you know, I like a short in and out very easily um, story. So I'm very pleased to have told you it, uh, even though yeah. you thought it was, hey, it happened in 1783. I'm sorry that there were <laughs> hey. electric generators involved. <laughs> it, it seems like maybe you wanted a different kind of story, but. <laughs> well, but I was not disappointed. What do you mean there are lights? What do you mean there are lights involved in this story? That's not what I thought I was getting. What, they're not rowing by hand? Uh. This is a bullshit shipwreck story. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Bye, Claire. Bye-bye. Testing. Great. Thank you for listening to It Chooses You. Your hosts are Teresa Sparks and Claire Patton. Our theme song is by Bobby Dart. If you'd like to get in touch with us, drop us an email at itchoosesyoupodcast at gmail.com.